Good afternoon. Let's uh, let's get started. So uh, I'm Arindam Chatterjee. I'm a group program manager in uh, Microsoft, uh, working on Azure Big Data. Uh, my team uh, works on HD Insight, which is our Hadoop offering. Uh, we also have other services: Azure Stream Analytics, Azure Data Lake Analytics, Azure Data Lake Store. These are all part of the Azure Big Data team. Uh, and today, in this talk, I'll uh, focus on HD Insight. Uh, and Databricks, and how to put these two together to build a modern data warehouse uh, on Azure. Uh, please feel free to uh, ask me any questions. Uh, I'll, the session is somewhat short, uh, but I'd be happy to stick around afterwards uh, to answer any questions uh, that you might have. All right, let's quickly uh, get going here. To set some context, uh, data is a key strategic asset, which is part of the reason that you are probably here today uh, in San Jose, uh, you know, learning about how data can play a key role uh, for your organization. So everything that happens around us today, uh, every purchase, every click, uh, every decision to uh, you know to adopt a product, you know, all of these things is generating very valuable and rich amount of data that can actually give rise to new innovations, new business models, and in fact, new inventions. But this vast amount of data that is, that is being generated and is being collected has to be handled, and frankly, handled, depending on the nature of the data, handled in a very sensitive way, right? in a very responsible way. But if you are able to do that, then this can actually differentiate you uh, from your competitors. You know, IDC, uh, back a couple of years ago, IDC estimated that the companies that are at the leading edge of this technology, of this data-driven transformation of their businesses, they are able to generate almost $1.6 trillion more in value for their companies, right? That's, that's a you know, humongous number, actually, you know, $1.6 trillion. And they also, you know, in a similar study done by Gartner, they, you know, what they found was that by 2020, about 10% of the world's organizations would have business units that are dedicated towards collecting, uh, processing, and commercializing the data sets that are unique to their domain. And these you know, companies are generating, on an average, they will generate about $100 million worth of business from just that, just that one business unit. So we are talking pretty you know, significant amount of money here. Right? But companies that are on this cutting edge of technology, right? It can bleed. It can be hard. You know, a lot of folks, and I've been coming to the DataWorks Summit, used to be called Hadoop Summit, for a, for a number of years, and it has been challenging. And customers are demanding more. But what are the challenges that customers are facing? Well, for one, changing data char characteristics. I speak in my role at Microsoft, I speak to a number of customers, and we ourselves have experienced this, where every two years, our data is actually growing almost two, sometimes three times every two years. That's a significant change from year to year, and being able to keep control of it, govern it, et cetera, becomes problematic. While the, you know, the per unit cost of big data, and you will hear it from you know, a lot of vendors out there, the per unit cost of big data is low, but the sheer scale of it means that at the end of the month or the quarter, you're going to get a big bill. The companies that are trying to be on this cutting edge of technology, gaining strategic insights from their data, are going to face a, a big bill. So the, the balance between price and performance becomes super important, and efficiency is the key. And at Microsoft, we are actually making a lot of our investments uh, to help you manage your costs. Fragmented architectures. Not everybody is born in the cloud. You know, there are sig significant amount of investments that have gone into on-premise systems. But you're moving to the cloud. How do you keep your current systems running while moving to the cloud and with minimal investment be able to get to the cloud? That leads to your fragmented architectures. And you have to balance your, your, the way you approach your on-premise system and its continued operation 
do your innovations in the cloud. And last but not the least, just the new insights and audiences. If you think back to five, maybe 10 years ago, most uh, enterprises, their main audience was the business analyst, who at the end of the month is telling you what has happened in the past. Did we do well? Did we do not so well? Why did we not do well? But it was all about questions of the past. The new questions that are being asked by folks like data scientists in your organizations is about the future. What will happen? What is likely to happen? What should I do so that my future is better than the past? And these are fundamentally different questions that are being asked by a different set of persona. But both systems have to coexist. And so the same system that is catering to the business analyst whose primary tools are things like Excel, Tableau, et cetera, is serving the needs of a new breed of audiences, the data scientists who want to experiment, who want to experiment very quickly. And they want to use things like Spark and R and you know, different data science tools. And so for an IT administrator, what do they do? How do they serve both sets of customers in these, with these challenges in mind? And what we are recommending to our customers, and a lot of our customers are actually succeeding in actually doing, is taking a data lake approach. But what does that approach give you? They're trying to assemble all their structured and unstructured data into what we call a hub, right? the data lake. What this allows you to do is unify all your data into one place so that you're not constantly moving them around. In the past, when you had very specialized stores for each of these you know, different steps, and you were moving data from one step to the next to the next, even if you look past the fact, the cost of it, of maintaining four, five separate copies of data, each move is a failure point. And the larger your data, the more likely that move is going to fail. And now you have to go back and restate and recover and all those kinds of things. So we are really recommending move your data into one landing zone. Once you're in there, the data can get transformed, but it will not move from one system to the next. And so you keep it there, but then you offer your customers, uh, your data scientists and analysts, a choice of their tools, whatever tools they like to use. And they can work on that data. The data doesn't have to move, right? So that's the integration part of it. Adapt. Work on, on premise if that's where you are. If you're not yet started on this journey, you can start on the cloud, of course. But a significant number of our customers you know, do have things on premises. So start there. That's OK. You've probably already, in that case, if you're in the big data on premises, you've probably used Hadoop already. That's good. You can move that to the cloud as well. And that's where HD Insight comes into the picture. You know, adopt, adoption of open source on premises is actually a key thing that will make your migration to the cloud you know, that much you know, less difficult and more seamless. And last but not the least, it's the analytics part of it, because that's what you're here for at the end of the day. You know, is being able to give people the choice of you know, your data science tools, your you know, analytics, the you know, old style analytics, if you will, or data warehousing tools, giving yourself the choice on the data that is sitting in your data lake. So that approach has proven to be very successful, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more detail later on in the, in the presentation. Now, as these requirements have changed, so has the technology. Right? Several of you have been, you know, we started off with mainframes, dedicated systems that are meant for processing large amounts of data. But these are expensive systems, right? big appliances that somebody would buy. The technology moved on to data marts, highly schematized, highly structured, well-planned, upfront, right? well-planned work uh, that were offered, capabilities that were offered in data marts to traditional data warehouses. And this is a little bit closer in time. So the cloud started to come into the picture here. But 
you could run these data warehouses, of course, on premises, but in a lot of cases in the cloud as well, in IaaS form factors. And some of these with data virtualization techniques, in the case of Microsoft's data warehouse, we have Polybase, were able to access unstructured data as well. But now we have the modern data warehouse. This is big data. This is terabytes. We are no longer talking about you know, gigabytes of data. We are talking about hundreds of terabytes, if not petabytes of data. Lots of different sources, because you really don't know where your next set of data is going to come from. At least you can't plan for it. Complex structured structures. You have you know, unstructured, semi-structured, uh, and of course structured data, and very complex BI requirements. And that's the modern data warehouse that I'm going to talk to you about how we, you can actually implement that in, on Azure. Now, the modern data warehouse is meant for the cloud, by the way. right? In fact, some of these requirements can't be met on premises. So what do we have? If your answer to the cloud, uh, answer to the cloud, which cloud question is, uh, is Azure, then what do we in Azure have for you? It all starts with the data sources that are on the left side of your screen there. These are your traditional data sources. OLTP systems, ERP systems, line of business applications, the thousands of them that might over time exist in an organization. But now you can further augment that with non-relational data from the web, from social media tweets, from IoT devices, right? from thermostats at home and airplane engines. I mean, there is, you, know, you name it, all kinds of devices are generating all kinds of data. All of these are landing up into the center part of that picture, where the prep and train part of it, the data preparation and training part, part of it, is typically being done by the, by the box in the lower half, the big data processing. Why? Because this is your three Vs, right? The volume, velocity, and variety. And that's where HD Insight, being the managed Hadoop offering, Azure Databricks, which is your Spark offering from, uh, from Microsoft and Databricks companies, and Azure Data Lake, to name a few, fit into that part. But then your model and serve is using sort of the traditional data warehousing uh, systems out there. Uh, I'll start with SQL Server, of course, but SQL DW in a VM, uh, in an IaaS form factor, or Azure SQL DW. Both of these offer data warehousing capabilities. But what we are also finding is that both systems, both in the data warehousing box over there, as well as the big data processing box, both have to understand each other. Oftentimes, our customers come and say, hey, I'm getting a, you know, a social media tweets. I want to combine that with some ERP system that they have at the back end. What are my employees saying? And which part of my organization, you know, what's their sentiment? I'm not going to try and move my ERP data that is sitting in a SQL server somewhere onto Azure Data Lake. So, can I query it just like that? And the answer to that is yes now, but it wasn't yes a few years ago. And you know, so we have to deal with that. At the same time, from a structured data warehouse perspective, people want to query massive amounts of data that actually might be sitting in the big data processing box over there. And that's where data virtualization becomes key. And I mentioned Polybase earlier is one example where we have implemented that. But that kind of technology, the data warehouse uh, virtualization technology, is coming up more and more and is an active area of investment for Microsoft. Once you have processed the data, then the next step is visualization and using all sorts of tools out there as is with the output of the processing step that I, that I described earlier. And at Microsoft, we do believe in providing the choice. We want to meet developers and users where they are and not force a particular technology on them. And so going by that tenet, if you will, what you will observe here 
you know, from a language standpoint, we support .NET, we support Java, Python, R, Ruby, right? Both frameworks and languages, uh, all of these frameworks and languages are supported. I haven't even mentioned operating systems here, by the way, right? Uh, we'll of course support, we do support Windows, but Linux is a big part of Azure. And HD Insight in particular is, I think at this point, about 99% of all HD Insight clusters are, are running on Linux. Advanced analytics. So now that the data is there for you, you know, machine learning, enabling machine learning through whatever tool set you want. We have built cognitive APIs that help you do some, some level of sentiment analysis and image processing and so on, uh, and you can further customize that. And of course, any BI tool. So if you're familiar with, I mentioned Tableau earlier, or dBeaver, right? I mean, there is any number of these tools and dashboards that you can use against data that is being output from the middle step. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So what I'm going to do the rest of the presentation is actually focus on HD Insight and Databricks and show you how to put these two services together to build a modern data warehouse. Okay, so the first service I'm going to talk about is HD Insight. What is HD Insight? HD Insight is your Spark and Hadoop offering in the cloud. It offers Spark, Hive, MapReduce, LLAP, Kafka, HBase, Storm, and you can actually you know, add other uh, services as well. It is a reliable open source analytics with industry leading 99.9% .9 availability SLA. What does that mean? And how do we do this? We actually monitor, Microsoft monitors the HD Insight cluster for you, the Hadoop cluster for you. Every single, not just the VM, but also the Hadoop service that is running on top of it. So if your region server, HBase region server starts to act up, our engineers get the alert first. We will wake up if it's 3 a.m. in the morning, take a look at it. In most cases, we'll fix it. And in very rare cases, if we need to, we will reach out to our partners in the Hortonworks and get the problem fixed for you. So it's our responsibility. It's our SLA. We spend a lot of time and effort in automa automated systems that can actually monitor the services and repair them even without manual intervention. That's, of course, an active area of research for us, and we keep improving over time. But that's also our, our responsibility. You get full monitoring support with Microsoft Operations Management Suite. What does that mean? Through a service called Azure Log Analytics, which you may be familiar with, all the alerts and events from an HD Insight cluster can be shown, can be collected and shown on a single pane of glass along with other services, that Azure services that you might be managing. So SQL DB, for instance. So imagine you have a global operation center, and several of our customers do, where they're maintaining and managing their HD inside op clusters in the US, from South America, from Europe, and Australia, all in one single dashboard. And not just their HD Insight cluster, but other Azure services as well. So you know, this was a, a, a very strong demand for these capabilities, and we delivered it uh, middle of last year. For developers, we'll of course start with Visual Studio. A lot of our innovations start there. But we have full IntelliJ and Eclipse support uh, both Jupyter and Zeppelin notebooks for data scientists, all of these are available uh, for the developers and data scientists. Enterprise-grade security. We are in the age of GDPR. So you know people are sensitive to this. And so we have in HD Insight, Kerberos support, as well as Ranger for access control. And we are working on Atlas as well for data governance capabilities that will be added soon. And last but not the least, we strongly believe that the success of Hadoop has been partly because of the number of different applications that are already out there. Uh, applications such as at scale, and you will see a lot of those you know, applications at the Explore floor um, as well. 
we work very closely with some of the most popular application vendors and certify them for use on uh, Azure with HD Insight. And with a single click install experience, you can actually deploy these uh, applications on uh, HDI clusters uh, you know, without obviously any trouble. And you know, it, this lets you, again, from your on-premise, if you're an on-premise customer, and you've used certain applications there, and you're moving to the cloud, your applications move there with you. Oh, come on. OK, all right. <laughs> it is true, <laughs> as of January 1st. Um, OK, Azure Databricks. Azure Databricks, it's, you know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Databricks, but Spark, uh, the founders of Spark started uh, the Databricks company. And as of late March, their service, the Spark service, is available on Azure uh, as a first party offering. What does that mean? That a combination of Databricks and, and Microsoft is standing behind that service versus, let's say, an, uh, an Azure IaaS service, um, in which case, it is the application vendor that is responsible for it. And Microsoft is providing the VM support there. So what's in Databricks? It is the easiest and the most, you know, from a collaboration standpoint, the easiest platform to use for Spark, for Apache Spark. It's a very simple collaboration environment. So if you have a team of data scientists that want to work together on a particular algorithm, on an experiment, they go and create a workspace. They have the clusters in there. They can create serverless uh, clusters as well and build their code that, that way before they deploy it uh, from, a, from an operational standpoint. It is the fastest Spark runtime in the market today. A lot of the innovations that the Databricks team does goes into that runtime. Over time, it does flow back into the trunk, Apache Spark trunk, but it first appears in the Databricks runtime. Enterprise-grade security, so role-based access control from a cluster, workspace, tables, each one of these levels have enterprise-grade role-based security access control there. And of course, encryption and compliance. These are, you know, this is work that keeps on going, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. Because it is running on Azure, it is optimized for Azure services. So, all Azure storage services, be it Azure Blob Storage or Azure Data Lake Store, your data can be in any one of these and can be read uh, and written to from Databricks. I already mentioned AAD for user authentication. And last but not the least, for data ingestion. HD Insight offers Kafka, and that's where your ingested data is coming from. But you have a you know, Kafka connector in Databricks that can actually read that and then you know, do your stream analytics on top of that. Okay. So before we, before we start uh, going deeper into actually building the, uh, the data warehouse, let's cover a few very important things. Uh, sometimes it doesn't get you know, talked about too much in the beginning of any project. When you're doing a POC, you're just trying to learn. But then before a POC turns into a production, this is where, you know, a lot of important discussions happen. So we talk about security first. In the case of security at Microsoft, as well as you know, most other companies actually, uh, we believe from in defense in depth, so outside in. So let's start with the perimeter. From a networking standpoint, Azure has virtual network support. And both HD Insight, as well as uh, Databricks, supports the notion of uh, virtual networks. You can deploy them both services into a virtual network. That's inbound. On an outbound side, we support through the notion of, uh, through the capability of network virtual appliances, NVAs, you can actually restrict outbound traffic as well. Once the traffic is in from a networking standpoint, you have to identify the user. That's authentication. On Azure, we have Azure Active Directory. In the case of HD Insight, because of its roots in Hadoop, and Hadoop supports uh, Kerberos as the primary authentication mechanism, we support Kerberos as well with Active Directory. Once authentication is done and you know who the user is, 
then is authorization. And role-based access control comes first over there. In the case of HD Insight, we also support ranger-based access control, and so very similar uh, concepts. And in Databricks, even though they don't support Ranger, but Databricks does have cluster workspace and table-level access control, as I mentioned before. Once all of these things are done, so the network traffic can reach you know, the, from the right places, right sources, it can reach your service. You know who the user is, and the user is allowed to do what they want to do. Then your last bit is your protecting, is your data protection part. Is your data on the wire, is it protected? Is it protected while it is in the store? And the answer to that in both cases is yes. You can, we use HT, uh, HTTPS is mandated between the client and the service. The, uh, encryption at rest, both services, because it, they are, you know, compute and store is separate, you can configure both stores uh, you can configure both stores using, uh, you know, bring your own key encryption and transparent data encryption. Okay. From a certification standpoint, all of these, you know, certification is a is a ongoing process. Uh, so we have industry certifications from across the world, uh, government certifications as well, and you can go to, you know, Azure Trust Center to get an updated list of what. Uh, services are uh, certified for what? Availability. Azure itself is available in over 42 regions. In over 42 reason, uh, regions, with HD Insight being available uh, in 26 plus regions, and Databricks is growing. Uh, it just GA'd, like I said, about you know three months ago. It's already in eight, is going to another four in the next couple of months. Okay, so it's more than likely that where you need it to be, both services are available there. So now let's look at some patterns. So the first pattern that we see is the batch analytics pattern. This is the more traditional one. And so here, primarily unstructured data, uh, but with some structured as well is coming in through a uh, you know, data movement tool uh, or data orchestration tool, if you will, like Azure Data Factory. And in the spirit of creating a data lake, it lands up in Azure Storage. Okay, You can use ADLS here as well. And then for the prep and train portion, you have a choice. You can either adopt the Hadoop stack, in which case you can use you know, HD Insight Spark, a lot of our customers do use Hive here as well. Or you can, of course, go to Databricks and use Databricks Spark there. In either case, the output of this can land back in Azure Storage. And then can be picked up either by SQL DW if you want to adopt the Microsoft stack. Or in the open source world, you can use Hive LLAP as well. And the visualize the results, you can do that in any number of analytical dashboards with, uh, with Power BI being one example of that. But then we have real-time analytics. In this case, we have a stream of unstructured data coming in through Azure HD Insight, Kafka in particular, and landing in some you know, Kafka consumer which could be Spark streaming in, in Azure Databricks. It could be Spark streaming in Azure HD Insight. There are any number of other options as well. I could have put Storm there, Storm being one of the services that we do offer in HD Insight as well. And then again, the output of it lands up in Azure Storage with SQL DW and Hive LLAP being sort of examples of what you can do with the streaming data but get some data warehousing type of uh, interactive querying capabilities. And visualized again through something like Power BI. Okay. So what we'll do quickly is we'll look at some code, uh, some steps I'll point out to ingest the data, prep and train, and then model and serve. 
So on Kafka, so the first step is to create your VNet. You want to make sure that your uh, Kafka brokers are safe, are isolated from the rest of the world. So you set up your VNet. I have a, an example of a PowerShell commandlet, uh, you know, simple command really to set up your VNet. Through the, our fairly simple UI, you choose Kafka as your cluster type. We are about to release Kafka 1.0 in, uh, in the next week or so. You choose Kafka. Then the third one is a little bash script there that sets up your brokers and your topics. And that's it. The one improvement we are making here is that we are going to actually have a REST proxy for your Kafka APIs. So that will reduce your work even more moving forward. But for now, you have to either build your own producer, or if you're using you know, a IoT Hub, then that's something that you would have to build and you know, put inside the VNet. But otherwise, this is pretty easy to set up. That's from your producer standpoint. But on a consumer, you would use Storm or Spark Streaming to consume the data that is coming in through Kafka. And here I have some examples. I'll, I'll share the deck uh, with the audience anyway later. But here, I, it, this is a Spark streaming example here. Uh, I had a Jupyter notebook that I have used to set this up. right? And you can see you set up the broker configuration, publish the message, and then your consumer just consumes it. right? Uh, we'll actually make this available on GitHub as well, some of these samples, so it's easy to get started. Then with HD Insights Spark, you've got in the same VNet, perhaps in a different subnet, or of course you can set up two VNets and pair them as well. But now again, you go into the HD Insight UI and you create a Spark cluster type. We are on Spark 2.2 at this time. In about another week or so, we'll, uh, we'll offer Spark 2.3 as well. And so that has a lot of improvements like continuous processing, et cetera. Uh, that you can take advantage of. But your Kafka messages now can be consumed through this HD inside Spark cluster. Now here, you actually have to add security. In the Kafka case, it's a little bit different because most of the Kafka consumers and producers are automated systems. So while security is important, where that security is important is more in where it is being stored and what keys are being used to encrypt the data. But here you have multiple users who could be logging into this cluster and actually querying the data. And so adding it to Azure Active Directory domain services and taking advantage of ranger-based access control policies becomes really critical here. And now here I have some examples. Uh, example of Spark streaming, where you are reading from, the, uh, from Kafka. And with a fairly simple line of code, you're actually writing out to HBase, which is actually a very common use case uh, in, in these kinds of scenarios. If you're using Databricks Spark, again, similar. The Kafka portion remains the same. But now for Databricks, you actually have to go create a Databricks workspace, add it to a VNet, and then peer the VNets between the VNet that is running your Kafka cluster and the, v, uh, uh, the VNet that your Databricks cluster is in. But once you do those two things, the Databricks actually has an inbuilt Kafka consumer. And through their notebook experience, you're able to actually read the consume the data and then output to files or tables. Again, very simple examples. You can customize it for your own requirements. And now last but not the least, now that your stream of data has been analyzed, cleaned up, curated, if you will, now you want to visualize it. And this is where Hive LLAP comes into the picture. In the HD Insight world, we call it the interactive query cluster. And so again, in the same VNet, you can now go ahead and create 
an HD Insight interactive query cluster. Again, you can see you know fairly straightforward UI drop down. You should always deploy this cluster with enterprise security package. Again, why? Because this particular cluster probably will have hundreds of users who are trying to access this. The longer you keep an HD, uh, interactive query or an LLAP cluster running, the better it is, because it's able to pull in that data, cache it, and serve it for the next user. But that also means that you have to have very strong, rich uh, access control policies for this. And so all of these personas that you have up there, analysts, power users, data engineers, et cetera, can use whatever tool they want that they are used to to access the data which is sitting inside this high value AP cluster. Okay. And so again, you know, just to recap, what we what we did here, ingest the data through Kafka, prepare and train using Spark. I did not give a Hive example, but the same parallel examples are available in Hive. So if you already have a bunch of Hive scripts, uh, you know, for your on-prem service. You can use them pretty much as is in HD Insight in the cloud. Uh, but the examples here were Spark. And then from an interactive query data exploration standpoint, you would land up using LLAP in our HD Insight interactive query cluster. Okay. So I'm going to just about stop here. We, these are some, uh, some customers. I think time's up. Uh, but these are some of the customers who are running production systems on HD Insight for a number of years now. Uh, all the use cases are up on our Azure website, uh, so please do visit. Um, you know, look at their use cases. In, you know, maybe draw some inspirations from them. Uh, otherwise, if you have any questions, I'm right here. Okay, thank you. Go ahead.